Well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to day two of the Neuroblastoma Parent Globial Symposium. Uh, it's wonderful to be with all of you today. I'm Gavin Lindberg. I have the honor of uh, moderating this session. And uh, just by way of quick introduction, I'm coming to you from the state of Maryland uh, here in the US, just outside of Washington, DC. And uh, also by way of introduction, I wanna make mention um, that my wife, Wendy and I are angel parents. And uh, our only child, Evan, passed away from neuroblastoma at the age of seven in 2010 after a four year battle that really defined courage. And um, his mom and I continue the fight um, against this horrible disease in his honor. And wanna thank everybody today for joining us for our session on pain and pain management. Our featured speaker is Perry Tuttleman. And let me introduce Perry now. Um, Perry is a PhD candidate in clinical psychology at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Canada. Her research is based at the Center for Pediatric Pain Research at the IWK Health Center and is focused on understanding the pain experiences of children with cancer across the disease trajectory. Perry has a strong interest in knowledge translation and patient engagement and research. And she's passionate about making sure that the best available research evidence on children's pain management makes it into the hands of children and parents who can use it. And uh, I wanna start by thanking Perry for her work on these critically important issues. I think as parents, um, we all know that there's not enough focus uh, on the impact of pain on our children and there's so much more that needs to be done to help neuroblastoma patients deal with the pain that accompanies both their treatment and their recovery. I uh, wanted to mention one housekeeping item before we get started, and that is the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. So um, obviously use that to submit your questions during the session. We will address the questions uh, following Perry's presentation. Um, if the button is not showing up, just tap or hover over uh, your cursor to bring it up. And if you see a question that you like, uh, give it a thumbs up and that'll help bump it up the priority list. So with that, let me uh, again, thank everyone for joining us and a big thank you to Perry. Um, and we look forward to your presentation. Over to you, Perry. Wonderful. Thank you so much um, for that uh, kind introduction um, and uh, for inviting me to speak here today about uh, pain and pain management. Um, over the next uh, 30 minutes or so, uh, I'm going to cover a variety of different topics. So I'm going to start off with a brief introduction um, to pain in the context of childhood cancer. And I'm going to share some strategies for managing procedure pain based on a new clinical practice guideline that was released this year. And then I'm going to talk about the importance of pain medication in the management of cancer related pain. Um, and then we're going to end off with some tips um, for advocating for your child's pain management. And um, we'll end off with some resources um, that you can take away from this presentation. So let's start off with the intro to pain. So I know I'm preaching to the choir here when I say that pain is a huge problem in pediatric oncology. We know that pain is one of the most common and distressing symptoms for children with cancer as reported by both children and their parents. Pain from cancer is complex um, and it can result from things like procedures, like blood draws and port access, treatments like side effects from chemo, or the disease itself. But our research has shown us that as many as 75% of parents don't know how to best manage their cancer-related pain. And unmanaged pain is a top regret for bereaved parents. But what I wanna emphasize in this talk today is that it doesn't have to be this way. We have decades worth of research evidence um, on strategies for how to best manage and assess pain in children with cancer. And so for my goal for the next 30 minutes or so is to provide you with some practical, easy to use strategies to manage your child's cancer pain so that you can feel informed and empowered to do what you can to manage your child's pain and also advocate for the best pain care. So what we know about pain is that it's a really complex symptom that's influenced by biological, 
psychological and social factors. Biologically, things like our genetics and medications that we've been exposed to can influence how we feel pain. Psychologically, pain can be influenced by our thoughts, our feelings, our memories of other painful experiences and expectations we have about the pain that we're going to experience. And socially, things like our culture, our environment, and how our parents respond to pain, for example, can influence how we feel pain. Building off of this, I wanted to acknowledge a few key fundamental building blocks about pain. Um, the first is that pain perception is regulated by the brain. So as you can see in this diagram here, when we injure ourselves, like in this photo from fire, our nerves send a signal all the way up to our brain that decides whether or not that sensation is going to be perceived as painful. And there's a number of factors, like I just described, that influence whether our brain decides whether it's going to be perceived as painful or not. Like our expectations, our mood, our genetics. Um, and so that means that all pain is both physical and psychological. And this has implications for how we manage pain. And something I do wanna note is that pain can be controlled. It's not something that's inevitable. It's something that we have strategies to manage. So we can harness what we know about all of these factors um, to manage pain. Uh, one of the current best practices in managing pain is something called the three P's approach. And that is combining pharmacological, psychological and physical strategies to manage pain. Um, and these are things that we're going to get into in the next um, few slides. Pain management typically works best when you can use these various strategies together as opposed to just one. Um, so let's talk about how we can man manage pain um, from cancer related procedures. I was fortunate to be part of an international group of researchers and clinicians to develop a clinical practice guideline on how to manage pain and distress related to needle procedures in children with cancer. And clinical practice guidelines um, are documents that outline recommendations that clinicians and parents can use to make decisions about different types of care. So to come up with the recommendations in this guideline, we reviewed the research evidence on different pharmacological, psychological, and social strategies um, for managing needle pain in children, including looking at the benefits and harms um, of each. And so I'm gonna share these recommendations with you today alongside other strategies that we know from the broader pain literature um, to be helpful for managing needle related pain. And so I'll specifically mention which ones come from the guideline. Uh, this guideline is available free for anyone to access. And so it, it's a helpful resource for parents to have and to use to advocate. And so I'll share the link to the guideline um, at the end of the session. In the guideline, we provide uh, different recommendations um, for managing needle-related pain, um, broken down into procedure type. So for minor procedures, lumbar puncture, and uh, major procedures. And I've also split up the recommendations based on things that parents can do before, during, and after the procedure. So starting um, with things that you can do before the procedure to help your child uh, manage pain. In the guideline, we recommend that prior to all needle procedures, healthcare providers, children, and parents should be educated and prepared to reduce pain um, and distress. So why, why should we tell children in, in advance? Some parents wonder, you know, it just makes them more anxious um, to tell them that they're going for a procedure. Um, well, we really advocate for, for preparing children, telling them in advance because it fosters trust um, it reduces their uncertainty. Um, and most importantly, it helps them uh, regulate their expectations, separating you know, what they're fantasizing about versus reality. And if you don't prepare you know, a child for a procedure, uh, they'll likely create their own version of what might happen in their mind, which might be worse than reality. And so preparing children in advance also gives them the opportunity to ask questions, express concerns and plan coping strategies. So you might be wondering, what do you exactly tell children um, when preparing them? 
Well, it's important to use specific detailed information um, and not give information that you can't predict, like the size of the needle, for example. It can be helpful to describe what they can expect using the different senses. So for example, what will they feel, see, hear, or smell? Like, will it be cold? Will it be wet? Will it pinch? Um, and it's critical to tell the child if it will be painful. Um, it's not helpful to say that it won't be painful if it will be. But it's also okay to say that you're not sure how painful it's going to be. If you don't know what's going to happen or if there will be pain, just tell your child that you're not exactly sure what's going to happen. At this time, you can also provide guidance on coping strategies and letting them know that you're confident um, that they can use these strategies to manage their pain or discomfort can really help. Um, at this time, you can also ask older children, you know, how much they want to know and what they want to know, because giving choice is always important. And so, for example, here are some things you might say, um, you know, like for a blood draw or things like things like that. You know, you might say you might feel a pinch and you might feel some pushing and pressure that'll last a few seconds. Or you might say you can help by holding still and breathing deeply with me or giving guidance on who will be in the room, who will be there, things like that. Um, there's not a lot of research on when is when it's best to tell children about procedures in advance. These are some suggestions I have based on studies um, that have been done. This is not part of the clinical practice guideline, but just from the broader pain management literature. Uh, research suggests that children five years and older should receive five or more days notice. They might need a little less if it's something more minor or something they don't get as distressed about. For children less than five, we really don't have good guidance on what's best, so use your best judgment. We recommend that for hospital visits and surgeries, um, toddlers should be told um, just the day before um, and again the day of. And preschoolers should be told three to five days in advance. So the next recommendation that we have um, is that we recommend the use of a topical anesthetic for all needle procedures. Topical anesthetics, also known as numbing creams, help to reduce the pain of needle pokes. Um, and these are things that you can buy yourself over the counter in Canada, the US and the UK, I know for sure. They come in cream and patch and gel form. Um, the main caveat is that they have to be applied ahead of time for the procedure to work. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. They're very, very safe. Uh, the main side effect is usually just some minor skin irritation. Um, but with that said, it's always good to check with your doctor to, to make sure it's appropriate for your child. We've heard um, from some families that they've gotten some pushback um, trying to use numbing creams in clinical settings. And so I wanted to address some of these myths and misconceptions that have come up about topical anesthetics. Um, and Dr. Anna Taddeo at the University of Toronto has done research um, on the use of topical anesthetics and debunking some of these myths. So for instance, some parents have been told um, that using numbing creams makes it harder to get veins. And there is no evidence for this. Um, and there's actually research that's been done showing that for IV insertions, for example, um, the use of numbing creams is associated with higher success rates. Others have been told um, that there's not enough time to use numbing creams. And um, it does take some planning ahead because it has to be applied beforehand. But in non-emergency situations, like for routine blood work, there's no reason why steps can't be taken to plan ahead to make sure that this happens. And in terms of the actual procedure, studies have been shown that it reduces the procedure time due to better cooperation. While we're on the topic um, of pain medications for procedures, I do want to note that in the clinical practice guideline, we recommend deep sedation or anesthesia be used for all major procedures and that it be offered to children undergoing lumbar puncture. So this is something to keep in mind, um, that this is a recommendation from the guideline that um, you could inquire about. So now I want to shift to some things that parents can do during procedures to help manage pain and distress. We recommend in the guideline the use of distraction for all NIDA procedures. 
And what we mean by distraction is taking attention away from pain by focusing on another engaging or fun activity. And it works really, really well for many children to take their mind off the procedure. I do want to acknowledge one caveat, and uh, that's that there are children who benefit from knowing and seeing what's going on. And so for them, they may prefer not to be distracted, and, and that's okay. Distraction doesn't have to be fancy. It can just be things like books or movies or games on a tablet. There's new research coming out with distraction techniques like virtual reality or humanoid robots. But so far, we don't have solid research um, that those more fancy techniques are better than the basic strategies I've listed here. Um, and so when selecting tools for distraction, just think about picking something that's interesting to your child, that's age appropriate, and that can capture their attention. And again, it's best to give choice whenever possible. There's a lot of great free apps that can serve as distractors on a tablet or a phone. And I've just listed some popular ones here from the Apple App Store. And so it can be good to check these out beforehand, download them, see if it's something your child might be interested in. While not included in the clinical practice guideline, we know from the broader children's pain research literature that relaxing the body can be a key way to reduce pain and anxiety associated with needle procedures. And the rationale is that if we can relax our body, it helps us to relax our mind, and it also helps to reduce muscle tension, which can in turn reduce pain. And so one way to do this is with deep breathing, also known as belly breathing. For older children, they can practice breathing in, expanding the stomach um, with as much air as possible, and then slowly breathing the air out. Um, it can be helpful to practice lying on your back to see your stomach filling with air and then deflating. And for younger children, a good way to practice this skill is describing it as something like taking a deep breath in like you're smelling flowers and then blowing the breath out like you're blowing out candles. There's also a number of great apps um, that have breathing exercises and other relaxation strategies um, associated with them. So I have included um, a couple of my favorites there as well. Imagery is another great way to relax the body and it really harnesses the power of imagination to picture a person or a place that makes you feel relaxed and happy. And so this is an example of a beach um, imagery script um, where, you know, we try and capture the sense of what that place would really be, try and make it as immersive, as immersive an, of an experience as possible, um, like the different sights and sounds and smells and what you might feel. Um, but it's helpful to have kids make up their own beforehand of a place that they find comfortable and relaxing. Um, and so sometimes that's imagining that they're in their own bed or snuggling with a favorite pet. So this is another strategy you can add to your toolbox. Believe it or not, the strategy with the most evidence for pain management in pediatric oncology is hypnosis. And so hypnosis is a more deepened, intense involvement um, and state of relaxation. And therapeutic hypnosis capitalizes on the child's natural ability for creativity, playfulness, imagination, and their ability to fantasize. Um, intensive training is required to become a therapeutic hypnosis provider, um, but parents and children can be trained um, by providers to provide um, self-hypnosis, which can be a really powerful tool. Um, the use of therapeutic suggestions um, is what makes hypnosis really different um, from relaxation. So for instance, the practitioner might use direct suggestions for pain relief um, to help the child, um, you know, change their perceptions and sensations. A common technique um, that's used with children, including in the oncology setting, is something called the magic glove. And it involves having children use mental imagery um, to imagine that a magic glove is being placed on their arm and that that will um, change how much pain they feel from a needle. And so they'll know what's going on, but not be bothered by the pain. And um, this is Dr. Leora Kuttner uh, in the video here, who's a psychologist based in Vancouver, British Columbia, and an expert in pediatric hypnosis. 
And she's produced a number of resources, including a really highly acclaimed video um, on the Magic Glove, which is on YouTube. And so I'll share the link um, in the chat at the end, um, just for you to check out. Again, it's um, something that has to be done by a trained provider, but this will, will give you a sense um, of what it's like. And so in the clinical practice guideline, we actually recommend the use of hypnosis for all needle procedures. The evidence is really that robust. Um, so providers um, to be trained, you have to be trained through the National Pediatric Hypnosis Training Institute. Um, so this is something you can ask about um, at your own institution if there's any clinicians trained um, to provide therapeutic hypnosis. And the last strategy for managing pain during procedures that I want to talk about is this one. We recommend that healthcare providers should offer parents the option to be present during their child's need or procedures if the child wishes to. But having said that, we know that what parents say and do accounts for over half of the pain and distress children experience during medical procedures. Many parents can resonate with this photo here. You can see that it's the baby getting the needle, but the father feeling the pain. And so imagine what information that nonverbal behavior is telling the child about how scary and painful the needle must be. So it's important to consider what parents say and do that can make their child's pain better or worse. We know from research that there's a number of things that parents inadvertently say and do that make their child's pain and distress worse. And these are things that draw the, the child's attention towards the pain. Things like criticism, apologizing, being overly empathic, and using reassurance. So telling the child not to worry or that they'll be okay. So it's kind of intuitive for parents to want to reassure their children during painful procedures. So why does it make pain worse? Um, and this quote from a children's novel might capture some of what's going on. Christopher Paul Curtis wrote, if an adult tells you not to worry and you weren't worried before, you better hurry up and start because you're actually already running late. And so we think that um, when parents use reassurance during painful procedures, it serves as a signal to the child, to the child that the parent is anxious or dis distressed and that they should be too. Instead, things that parents can do to decrease pain are things that take the child's attention off the pain. So these are things like um, talking about something unrelated to the procedure. Um, so a form of distraction really, like what kind of cake do you want next week for your birthday? Um, using humor and then also, you know, giving them suggestions on how to cope. Like let's sing a song together, let's play Angry Birds, you know, pointing to different things in the room that they can look at, things like that. So now I want to shift to um, a few different strategies that parents can use after the procedure um, to make future pain experiences go better. We're learning more and more um, that the way children think and remember about painful experiences is really important um, because this influences how they cope with painful experiences in the future. And so this isn't something captured in the clinical practice guideline, but something we draw on from the broader pediatric pain literature. Um, and a lot of work in this area has been done by Melanie Knoll at the University of Calgary. We know that memory is not like a tape recorder. You can't play the events back and remember them exactly as they happened. And so some kids will remember painful experiences accurately or even in more positive ways, but others will remember it as being way worse than it actually was. Um, so shifting that thinking and trying to help children remember painful experiences in a more positive way um, helps kids do so much better in the future. And as a parent, you can help your child remember the painful experience in a positive way in how you talk to them about the painful event afterwards. Um, so we recommend, you know, focusing on what went well during the procedure, being realistic, and also praising how brave they were. So in terms of focusing on what went well, you might want to shift your spotlight of attention to anything positive that happened. For instance, things like coping strategies that they used, like it was excellent when you took some deep breaths. In terms of being realistic, you wanna help the child remember exactly what happened. 
or sorry, what actually happened. Um, Cause a lot of children will remember it as being more negative than it actually was. So reminding them that they didn't think it was that scary, you know, reminding them how well they did sitting still, um, reminding them how they felt in control during the procedure. And finally, um, it's important to praise their bravery. Um, so telling them how brave they were, um, asking them what made them feel brave, what helped them to feel brave and how they can feel brave again next time. And so this slide brings me to the end of the section on procedure pain management. Uh, there's many more research-based strategies you might be interested in learning about. Um, so I'm gonna share some links at the end where you can find more information. And so we've covered procedure related pain in depth and you might be wondering, what about managing pain from tumors or treatments or pain at end of life? We don't have as much research on managing these specific types of pain compared to procedure pain, uh, but the same 3P principles apply. Many of the strategies I talked about for procedure pain management, like relaxation and imagery and hypnosis can help with other forms of pain as well. But I do want to note that pharmacological strategies, so the use of medications, play an especially big role here. Um, I wanted to touch on a few important points related to pain medication. So for pain medications to work best, it's really important that they're used exactly as prescribed. Research has shown us that parents often give their children less pain medication than they were prescribed, or they get it less frequently, or use less powerful types of medications, or they only wait to give it when the pain is really bad, uh, which then it's hard to catch up and, and help manage it. So it's really important to use the pain medication exactly as prescribed, even opioids, which play an important role in cancer pain management. Parents have told us that you know, some of their reluctance to use pain medication might stem from fears about addiction or side effects. And there is a lot of media coverage about the potential harms of pain medications. But I wanna note that when used properly for pain, addiction is extremely rare, even for strong pain medications like opioids. And in fact, when they're used um, properly to control pain, they can actually be important in preventing the development of chronic pain and dependence on pain medication in the future. So it's important to speak with your child's doctor if you have any questions or concerns about their pain medications. And so coming into uh, one of the last sections here, I wanna talk a little bit about um, how to advocate for your child to make sure they get the best pain care possible. Time and time again, research has shown us that children, including children with cancer, are often undertreated for pain. And this is why parent advocacy is so important. Parents often assume that everything possible is already being done to manage their child's pain, and that if there was something more, it would already be offered. But when parents are asked why they aren't using certain pain management techniques, they say that their doctors aren't suggesting them. And then when doctors are asked why they're not discussing those pain control options, they often say that the parents aren't asking. And so this can become a really vicious cycle. So don't be afraid to ask what's being done to manage your child's pain. It's important to be proactive with helping your child cope and making sure they have the appropriate pain medications available. Um, especially for older children, it's helpful to encourage them to voice their own needs, including how they feel. Um, and so this shows that, you know, that you trust your child and it shows them that you have confidence in them and their ability to cope and their ability um, to report their symptoms and, and advocate. Research um, has shown us that parents really know their kids best, including when it comes to gauging how much pain they're in. And so this highlights how important it is to speak up on behalf of your child if you feel like they're in pain, even if you might feel intimidated. It's also important to ask a lot of questions. For instance, if you're unsure about a pain medication that's been prescribed for your child, you might wanna ask about the, what the benefits are, what the risks are, what the alternatives might be. And so this is a helpful cheat sheet um, that you can use to ask your clinical questions um, in terms of you know, deciding on pain medication options um, or as a guide to kind of ask providers what's being done to manage pain, um, what the options are. 
And finally, I'll end off by saying that, um, you know, I don't want you to feel afraid to ask for referrals if you aren't satisfied with your child's pain care. Most hospitals um, have a range of services um, that can be consulted um, if you're feeling like your child is experiencing pain and it's not being resolved. Um, so most hospitals have an acute pain team, which is comprised of doctors and nurses who specialize in managing pain crises. Child life specialists play an important role in helping children prepare for procedures and cope during procedures. Palliative care teams can help with symptom management, both during treatment and end of life. And some hospitals have psychologists that specialize in working with children with severe medical fears and phobias. So this is good to keep in mind as well. And before we um, jump to the Q&A session, I wanted to point to one specific resource that you might be interested in learning more about. Um, so Kids Cancer Pain was a research project that I was part of that aimed to create and share parent resources specifically on the top of, topic of kids cancer pain. Um, it was a social media campaign that we ran in partnership with the Cancer Knowledge Network, which is an online cancer education resource. Um, and we aimed to take the research evidence on children's cancer pain out from behind journal paywalls and placed in the hands of parents over social media. And the project was led by my supervisor, Dr. Christine Chambers and Dr. Jennifer Stinson at the University of Toronto. And here's a brief video um, on the project. As part of the campaign, we created a number of blog posts, videos, images, resources, all focused on disseminating evidence-based information um, on managing pain in children with cancer. So these are just a sampling of uh, some of the resources that we created um, and they're all available on our website now. And so I'll share that link um, in the chat. And with that, I would just like to thank you for your attention and uh, for having me participate and uh, look forward to taking your questions. Well, Perry, thank you so much for all that great work and a really, really important presentation. Um, you know, this has been so insightful for me and I'm sure others, and we do have a few questions that uh, if you don't mind, we'll jump into here. For sure. Um, yeah, let me just uh, pull the first one up here. Um, our toddler has to be held down for needle procedures, making them more anxious. How do you propose handling this experience when distracting doesn't seem to work? Absolutely, that's a great question. And in the clinical practice guideline, we talk about how it's important for these you know, strategies to be implemented as early in treatment as possible to prevent you know, these needle fears from, from starting. Um, in the pain management world, we talk about, you know, the idea that a child should never be restrained for a non-urgent medical procedure. Um, you know, 
it, it might take extra time, you know, a referral to psychology, a referral to child life, to work on preparation, to work on exposure and working through some of those fears would be helpful. Um, it, it might take uh, more time um, to do the procedure, but uh, a colleague of mine, Dr. Stefan Friedrichsdorf, um, who's a palliative care physician in the US, has said, you know, there's always enough people to restrain a child so we can use those people to implement the pain management strategy so that they don't have to be restrained. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, next question. Um, does hypnosis have any age restrictions? Will it be successful with a two-year-old? So the, the lower age range is three, I believe. Um, so that is um, from the National Hypnosis Training Institute. Um, there might be some individual differences, so it could be worth exploring or um, exploring as your child gets older. Yeah, thank you. And then uh, one more here. Um, our eight-year-old has finished treatment and is now due to repeat all childhood immunizations. He goes into blind panic with any needle procedure and needs to mm -hmm. be held. Do you have any specific advice? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, my PhD research has actually focused on the pain experience in childhood cancer survivors. Um, and I'm just finishing a study now looking at children's experiences of painful procedures, medical tests and surveillance um, in follow up for childhood cancer. And this is something common that we're hearing. Um, many of the strategies that I discussed today are things that work for almost any needle procedure. So things like topical anesthetics, things like distraction, preparation are all vitally important. It sounds like a referral to psychology or child life could also be helpful here to work through some of the past um, experiences that have been painful and traumatic, um, and then working to support um, as much as possible. We know that doing, you know, many procedures at one time can be challenging. So seeing if they can be split up um, could be helpful as well. Thank you for that. And, you know, I, I just wanted to make a comment about um, your last section around advocating for your child. And I had actually uh, written down the phrase before you put up the slide about how nobody knows your child as well as you do, right? And um, I think that is such an important point. And, um, you know, I, I think about how when we go to a restaurant or a retail establishment and uh, we feel like we're getting uh, inferior service, you know, we're pretty quick to ask for the manager, right? We're pretty quick to ask for somebody who we think is gonna listen to us and, and hear us. So, you know, I just wondered if you would talk for just a minute about, you know, that idea that if you feel like you're being given lip service or maybe even ignored from the person who's, who's caring for your child, um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with asking to speak with um, the attending or somebody who you think um, is going to give you the attention that your child deserves. Absolutely. That's an excellent point. And Gavin and I were actually just talking about this before the session and we hear these stories from parents all over the world, including here, that you know pain management isn't a priority um, or isn't made a priority oftentimes um, in their clinical encounters. Um, so it's important to advocate. It's important to ask to speak to the various services that I listed. Um, you know, if you're not satisfied with how your child's pain is being managed in the hospital, it's absolutely okay to ask for a referral to the acute pain service. We know from the children's pain literature that veterinarians actually get five times more pain management education than physicians do. So it could be, you know, totally possible that the clinician um, responsible for your child just might not be knowledgeable or aware of the best strategies for how to manage pain. So it's okay to ask for the pain expert. Wow, that's an amazing and, and um, disappointing statistics about, about veterinarians, my goodness. Hey, we've got two more questions that have populated here. Let me get to them quickly. Um, first one is my son is three now and hates needle procedures. And uh, will he forget about these experiences later on? Oh, so that's a great question. We're still learning about, um, you know, what children know and remember. We know that um, 
autobiographical memories, so things that we remember about our own lives, are considered intact, um, which means you can access them again later in life, usually by around age four. So it sounds like he's just at, at kind of the cusp of that. But that being said, we ha also have our neural memories. So that's what our cells and our nervous system and our body remembers. Um, so there has been research done on babies in the neonatal intensive care unit where um, the painful procedures that they've experienced early on in life have left memories on their nervous system and make them more sensitive to pain in the future. So from a conscious perspective, maybe yes, maybe no. From a neural perspective, it's still important to manage the pain as best as possible. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, the next question here, um, and I think we touched on this a little bit, but do nurses and clinicians need more education about pain and pain management as well as parents? Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, pain, because it's such a um, cross-disciplinary thing, you know, it's not like a topic on cardiology, a topic on neurology, you know, it's something that crosses every type of, um, of, of issue. It, it makes it even more important, but also means that it hasn't gotten um, the time that it deserves in medical and nursing and pretty much any um, medical curriculum. So it's something um, that needs to happen for sure. Uh, something that my supervisor, Dr. Christine Chambers, often says is that we need to take a multi-pronged approach um, to changing pain management. So, you know, we need to work on changing things at the institutional level, at the, you know, healthcare provider level, at the parent level, at the child level. Um, and there are um, initiatives I know in Canada that are being done to incorporate pain management into, you know, medical curricula. Um, and as well as institutional um, policies, there's something called child kind, which is a certification that hospitals can get. Um, that means that they do everything possible to manage children's pain. Um, so I know there's, there's things happening at multiple levels and we need to, to take action at all those levels. Thank you. And then one last one here, a, a comment um, that I think we can all relate to this uh, person writes, um, I'm always conflicted about telling the truth. Uh, yes, you do have to get an injection versus I don't know what the doctor wants today. That's a tough place for parents to be in. And they're in that place all the time. Absolutely. Um, you make an excellent point. Um, and I think, you know, it's just about being honest, like being honest with that information. Like, I don't know what's going to happen at today's appointment. There might be, you know, a procedure. It might also just be, um, you know, talking with the doctor today. Uh, because one of the worst things that could happen is that you say, no, there's not going to be a needle. The child prepares for that. And then there is, and it's a huge surprise and shock. And, and then that becomes that becomes worse. So I think just being, you know, open and honest that you don't know is, is okay. Well, Perry, thank you again so much for this. Um, you know, just incredibly valuable, I'm sure to everyone who participated today. Um, thank you also for the resources that you posted here in the chat uh, box and, no um, you know, keep doing what you're doing because it's incredibly, incredibly valuable. Um, and yeah, we've reached the end of this session. Um, but I do want to remind everyone about two additional sessions. Um, the first one entitled Cell Therapies and Neuroblastoma. This is a panel session that's running concurrently to this one and has about 45 minutes left, I think. And the second session entitled DFMO uh, Studies at the Beach Childhood Cancer Research Consortium, which is coming up after the break. Um, so thanks again to everyone for being with us. Perry, thank you again. I also want to say a special word of thanks in closing to the wonderful um, CNCF and Solving Kids Cancer staff who put this just amazing symposium together. Uh, what a blessing for parents around the world um, and just a, a big round of applause for them and all the, the work that they put into this. So with that, I hope everyone um, is well, stays well and healthy and uh, have a good rest of the day.